Welcome to this presentation aimed at Category 3 and Category 4 churches, but which we hope churches of other categories will help find useful. I'm Peter Duff and I'm the Assistant DAC Secretary and I'll be talking about working with the DAC, the Secretary for which is Stephen Slight. What is the DAC? Well, its full title is the Lincoln Diocesan Advisory Committee for the Care of Churches. It's a statutory committee under the Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction and Care of Churches Measure 2018, although its origins go back to 1921. Every diocese in England has a DAC. It is as much loved as the planning committee of the local authority, and indeed exercises many of the same functions as a planning authority in regard to the interior of church buildings and shares many of the functions relating to the exterior. The DAC is made up of both clergy and laity, who are all appointed by the bishop for the expertise which they bring in regard to the care of historic churches and their contents on liturgy and worship. None of the members are paid for the work that they do for the DAC, and most are volunteers. What isn't the DAC? Contrary to what I've just said, it is not a planning committee, in that the DAC does not grant permission for anything. That is the prerogative of the Chancellor of the Diocese or, in the case of list B applications and temporary minor reordering licences, the Archdeacon. What does the DAC do? Its role in the main is to advise the Chancellor of the Diocese where parishes want to make alterations to their buildings. However, it also has a very significant role, more widely in advising the Archdeacons and parishes on the care of the church buildings of the Diocese, and that happens particularly through the officers of the DAC and the church buildings team. Myself and Stephen, and Matthew Godfrey, the Historic Church's Support Officer, and Fran Bell, the Church Development Officer. What doesn't it do? The DAC does not give permission, and equally it doesn't reject work. Its role is advisory. It's in the title. Any final decision on a faculty application is made by the Chancellor of the Diocese. The worshipful Mark Bishop is the Chancellor, the Bishop's official principal, and he presides over the consistory court, which actually grants the faculty. He is an independent judge who considers the parish's proposals put before him and the advice he received. That will include the DACs, but might also be from Historic England, the Church Buildings Council, or one of the amenity societies. He will weigh all this up in considering whether to grant permission or not. So back to the nitty gritty of how to work with the DAC. The most important thing that you can do is open up the channels of communication and talk to the DAC from an early stage. An email or telephone call to Stephen Slight or myself will allow us to give you an idea of what permissions are required and how best to go about getting them. Many works don't require a faculty and can be done under a list B application and we can guide you on when that might be the case. We are pleased to give advice on how to use the online faculty system and to talk you through an application. Sit in front of your computer and the online faculty system and give us a call and we can look at the application together. The DAC is happy to send a delegation to visit and to talk about what you want to do and give you an idea of whether you are going in the right direction. It may be a group of members of the DAC or it might be an individual member or advisor. The DAC has advisors on almost anything which might affect a church building. Bells, electrics, heating and lighting, textiles, clocks, books and manuscripts, stained glass, monuments and organs. Their advice is free, and again, all these are volunteers, and the skills they bring and the advice they give are a contribution to the work of the church in Greater Lincolnshire. The committee is happy to look at proposals for informal advice to see if you're going in the right direction. Let myself or Stephen Slight have as much information as possible, and we will pass it before the committee or an advisor to gain their thoughts in helping you frame it for a formal application. Some often heard comments. It takes so long. An application for faculty doesn't have to take a long time. The DAC closing date for a meeting is a fortnight before the meeting itself. If the application is submitted then, it will be considered, however many applications there might be on the agenda. We aim to get responses out within a week or so of that meeting, and a good number get recommended at the first time of asking. It could therefore only be on the DAC's virtual desk for less than a month. Another one is they never agree to anything. The DAC almost never says no to a proposal. Indeed, it can't say no. It will almost always try to work with the parish to get what it wants to achieve, even if it wasn't how the parish first thought of doing it. There is almost always a way of introducing a toilet and a survey into a church, and the DAC will be happy to offer thoughts on where the most appropriate site it might be. Removal of all of the pews in a historic church might be more problematic, but it isn't unachievable to provide at least some flexible space within a building. It just needs good reasons why the parish wants to do it, based on good evidence and research. And don't forget that it isn't the DAC's decision, it is the Chancellor's, 
And even if the DEAC doesn't recommend the work, you can still make your application to the Chancellor and ask him to give his judgment. What we're now going to do is look at what can be achieved. I will talk us through a couple of smaller works that parishes have undertaken, a media project and a big reordering scheme. The first example we're going to look at is Barks and St Nicholas. They apply for temporary minor reordering licence to change one pew 180 degrees in order to fit a table in. The example on the left is the before and the example on the right is the after. This allowed them to put a table in so that afterwards the parishioners could have a tea and coffee. It was a very simple but very effective way of gaining some community space and keeping people into the church after services rather than going straight home. This obviously allowed for a bit more socialisation beyond the regular pattern of worship. They did this under a temporary minor reordering licence, and the clues are in the title. Firstly, it is temporary. The Archdeacon will probably give you about a year to 18 months to trial this new arrangement. Nextly, it is minor. The whole point is that the works are a minor piece of work rather than major, which we'll get to later. Normally the works are perfectly reversible, so if the parish were to not favour this new option, they could just simply change things back to how they once were and no one be any wiser. By minor, we tend to mean five or six pews at most that are affected, normally by relocation within the church building or removal. But as we say, if you get to the end of the temporary minor reordering licence and you do not like the new arrangement, you can put things back. But if you do like the new arrangement, please do speak to us and we'll talk you through the process to gain the relevant permissions to keep things as are. The next example we're going to look at is from Earnham St Andrew. This is the installation of a servery. The example on the left shows the servery against the wall of the aisle. It's a simple piece of ecclesiastical furniture that is remarkably discreet. Until the lid has been lifted, you would never know that that is actually a servery. Indeed, you would probably think it's a frontal's chest. The example on the right is a further piece of furniture that has been made to match the servery. This has increased storage capacity within the church and has helped them put away things like cups and saucers out of the way of the public eye. The next two examples I'm going to show you are a toilet and servery installation at Hoff on the Hill. They've put these at the west ends of their aisles. The servery is located at the west end of the south aisle, whereas the toilet is at the west end of the north aisle. You will also see outside the toilet that there's a change in the floor pattern. This is because they've removed some pews to allow for more flexible space and for circulation space so that people can actually access the facilities. This additional space can then be used, as you can see, by the stacking of the chairs for more flexible worship or for more community events. If you're going to have a toilet and a survey, you should be expecting to use it for things like cafes, but also for after services so that people can get together and have a chat after the service has been completed. One thing that we tend to advise is if you were to put the toilet and the survey together, it is beneficial. It helps the water enter and exit the church building in the same kind of area. The next slide is a perfect example of this. This is an example from West Deep in St Andrew. What West Deepin have done is they've cornered off the section of the west end of the North Isle. Within that they've installed a toilet pod and you can see that by the screen that is in the front of the picture there. In front of it is sat the servery and this is what a servery looks like with the lid up. The next project we're going to look at is much more of a larger scale project and this comes from Epworth, again another St Andrew. What they've managed to achieve here is quite remarkable. They've removed all of the pews and installed some chairs. They've created a mezzanine in which they do the bell ringing within the tower. They've screened it off to create some meeting space and they've installed a toilet and a servery and an interpretation centre. The first slide we're going to look at is the mezzanine that is screened off. The bottom is the meeting space and the top is where the bells are now rang from. The second slide is a view from that bell ringing platform. You can look from west to east at the works that they have completed. There's new flooring throughout. There's an interpretation space on the left hand side of the screen and throughout there is new heating and new lighting that really freshens up the place and gives it a nice bright and airy feel. In order to achieve such works, Epworth engaged all of the advisors and all of the members of the delegation at a very early stage of the process. This allowed them to get sound advice as to what could possibly be achieved, the correct kind of lighting, the correct kind of heating and the correct kind of flooring finish for the kind of works they wanted to do. The final slide that we can show you is a cross section of what the church building actually looks like to give you an impression as to what the interior is laid out like. 
You should be able to see quite clearly there, within the tower space, the new bell ringing floor with the meeting room underneath, and a nice empty nave for lots of flexible use, whether it be worship or community. Thank you for watching this training video. Do have a look at others in the series, and if you have any questions, please contact us at the Church Buildings team.